I speak to you today not only for myself, but also for my three daughters, each in their 30s, and also for my four beautiful grandchildren, each under three. I want to tell you two stories. The first is entitled, What Has Been? You already know it because you were its main character. It began in 2002. There are three parts. The first describes the great American experiment to create a record high prosperity for all citizens and the institutions we created. Debt capacity, real and imagined, was converted to material possessions at a rate and magnitude not previously experienced. Unemployment through construction and war fell to 4.6%. Acquisition of houses, cars, consumer goods, government services, and wars proceeded without limit and with little or any cash down and forever, if ever, to pay. The second section starts at the end of 2007. Abruptly and without warning, debts were called and could not be paid. The nation's store of value in housing, securities, and the earning power of its citizens fell 40%. Real unemployment exceeded 20%. Liquidity, the bloodstream of the economy, almost evaporated. The third section is happening as we talk. It asks a series of questions yet without answers. Can a nation and its financial system that cannot pay its debts stay in business? Does shifting our unpayable debts to the Federal Reserve, the federal government, and China repair a damaged economy? Is a healthy country characterized after five years where half its people are waiting for the turnaround of the recession, while the other half continues to live through the downturn of the depression. So only one revelation is certain. We've come to the end of the era of getting whatever we want when we want it. We've come to the end of entitlement, the age of entitlement. The second story is your story as well. Its title is Where We Could Be. We could call it the age of possibility, and maybe the age of common sense. It asks only one question. What part do you want to play to make its ending, unlike the first story, positive and happy? It has seven sections. They are work, energy, education, life quality, environment, foreign entanglements, and debt reduction. Here are a few of my ideas. Work. Work is essential to our economic well-being, our fulfillment, and our reciprocal contribution to our broader community. It is, in fact, the cornerstone of civilization. Yet at least 10 to 15% of our workforce who want to go to work immediately has been unemployed for five years without much real improvement. A free market rewards productivity, more output with fewer people. Before it was agriculture and industry, today is manufacturing, tomorrow will be services and government expense. Tasks continually require fewer people to perform through technology, management science, and outsourcing. So we need to give the unemployed jobs, the current ones and the future ones. There are three ways to do this. First, pay everyone who wants to work and needs to work to work, rather than paying them not to work. They can be paid the same wages, medical insurance, food stamps, and other benefits at the same rate as unemployment compensation. We can use the same distribution apparatus, federal and state. The jobs can include job training, vocational training, going to school, plant trees, teach and assist in schools, and an elderly workforce. Funding can come from unemployment compensation funds, reduction in social costs like crime and idleness, federal and state employment funds funded by incremental ta bond funded by incremental taxes from incremental income activity. The magnitude I calculate at $30,000 per person, including overhead and administration, would be about $150 billion a year for each 5 million people, and about twice that for 10 million people. And this is a lot less than the stimulus programs that we're trying to put into place, and it also gets direct results, which the stimulus programs haven't. Secondly, 
let's establish a compulsory national service requirement for two years for those aged 18 to 35. I calculate that would take in about 8 million people. Same jobs as above, add a youth work corps, especially to prepare the unprepared to earn a living and to catch up on poor education. Much lower cost per person for this type of service as indicated by the military and the Peace Corps. And then finally, let's look at employment as building infrastructure. Infrastructure is the most valuable raw material in our economy, and today it's defined not so much as bridges and highways, but as knowledge and information, as you know. Science, technology, computer, medicine, engineering, design, research, and application are the investments of the nation. Give those qualified and career-dedicated 30-year government loans for given at the rate of 1 30th a year for each year worked in the given profession or the equivalent. Putting the country's people to work is the greatest investment our country can make. Section two, energy. We have an abundant sources of energy in our country, but we have one critical problem, dependence on foreign oil. Why? We use 20 million barrels a day of oil, and we produce about 9 million barrels a day, which we'll do for a long time. Therefore, the energy problem is confined to the 11 million barrels a day of foreign oil that we use and buy. There are three reasons. One, if this oil gets cut off, the country gets shut down. Two, at best, we can get about 2 million barrels a day from Canada. And three, the strategic oil reserve will last barely 100 days. Secondly, the real price of foreign oil to the taxpayers is not the $100 a barrel or the $4 a gallon, but three to four times that amount when you add in the cost of the military to defend it, alliances to protect it and preserve it, and wars to protect it. World oil demand is growing 1% a year. Production is level. So as new, new Oil wars are on the horizon, either economic or military. They're likely, and they'll be coming. In a word, foreign oil dependence is a clear and present national emergency. To stop using foreign oil, common sense tells us we need to stop using foreign oil. We're already doing that voluntarily through substitutes. Conservation, ethanol, sun, wind, geothermal, natural gas, plants, sugar, and so on. All costs are, are effective compared to the real cost of the foreign oil. And there is a rapidly voluntary shift toward moving away from oil. That shift can be speeded up. If we could set and mandate a requirement that every year we reduce consumption of foreign oil by half a million barrels to one million barrels a day, we can, we can achieve that goal. If not, we would tax a dollar a gallon in the 57 metropolitan areas where there is the most usage and the less, and the less need for cars because of alternative transportation. The taxes would go to a highway fund or infrastructure. I've been in transportation for 40 some odd years. I don't think we've had a better explanation than what Joseph Clare gave us today as to how we can accomplish this reduction of use of oil. The third section is education. The core of our country's resources is education, but we're not serious about it, certainly not enough. Everyone who produces a child has the responsibility to educate that child. Every citizen must, must be literate in reading, math, computer, and health practices. This is the product of compulsory national service. The US must be a world leader by any measurement in science and technology. This is the product of the infrastructure work program. Poor education at any level, as you know, is like an infectious disease. The country can't tolerate it. The fourth area, life quality. It is time for a change or I should rather ask this audience, is it time for a change in our behavior and attitude to achieve the most we can of happiness and quality of lives? We've learned the pitfalls of material accumulation as a goal 
and for its own sake? What about a life that is more people-centered and less thing-centered? There are low-cost, easily accessible ways to improve health and longevity, exercise, nutrition, mental activity, productivity, and richness, family, friends, helping others, education, passionate pursuits. Is happiness acquisition enough? I think we have the answer. The fifth section is environment. Let's imagine what might happen were there a worldwide environmental competition. Make environment a competitive advantage. Every country could be graded or indexed on its quality of air, water, soil, carbon, and dust. How does the US compare with China, for example? A tariff system based upon the measured results for environmental damage could be assessed and the cost added to the country that exports goods which come from a place where they are damaging the environment. The funds from these tariffs could be placed into a world fund to clean up the world's environment. I don't have enough time to tell you how that might be administrated, but uh, think about it, it's a good idea. Okay. Finally, the environment, a, a clean environment helps exporting. First, it reduces costs through recycling and reuse, clean energy, and it reduces health costs through cleaner water and food. Also, it helps improve trade through immigration, tourism, and investment. The sixth area is for, foreign entanglements. George Washington warned in his farewell address against entanglements with foreign countries. He said, just trade with them. Today, we are on the soil and in the lives of over 150 countries. Would we gladly invite reciprocal activity on our soil and our lives from each of these countries in the same way that we're involved? Every day, George Washington asks us by satellite, what are we trying to do? For what are we going, for what are we getting twisted up and caught up internationally? And every day we block his transmission because we have no answer. We are witnessing now a long national political campaign. There's no mention of achieving national superiority in diplomacy or weapon elimination or anything else that makes sense. War everywhere in the world, there is either war or preparation for war. Yet the success of this planet is not how many people we can kill, but how many people we can feed and make happy. The final section is debt reduction. And I've divided this into three areas. Uh, one, consumer. Two, and I put together, and you'll see why, business, state, and local. And the third is federal. In the consumer ed debt area, let me advance a brand new economic theory that you won't hear anywhere. Live within your means. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can earn money as we found in the work section, number one. Everyone can gain satisfaction and entertainment with less spending and less material acquisition as we learned in the quality of life section, number four. New convention number one, save first and buy later. Put down 50% for your cars and houses and then buy them. A lot less problem with foreclosures and so on. If you have a credit card, limit the limit. Limit the limit on the card to 10% of your adjusted gross income. That will avoid you paying 24% when you're not paying it back and allow you to do the one thing you should do is pay it back. Secondly, let's move into business, state, and municipality. Businesses are self-correcting, and that's pretty easy to determine by the market and by accurate information to the debt holders. After five years of sympathetic warning, it no longer makes sense to bail out or nationalize businesses. Those who can't manage their balance sheets should go out of business or merge with others. For states and municipalities that can't manage their debt, we might have to redefine the political and economic structure of the country. Cities and towns can be merged or sold. States can be split up, sold to other states or the federal government outright or in receivership. Like business executives, elected officials must run their institutions responsibly and at a profit. 
Finally, the federal government. It matters to us how we pay this debt back because it is ours and we are the government. There are two possibilities. Either we balance the federal finances or we don't. There are seven good ways that are in the public discussion and in the public domain and in the political conversation to balance the federal debt. And one I'll give you that isn't in those areas, but one I like better than any of them. The seven are increase the age for Social Security and Medicare payments, raise taxes by eliminating most deductions, stop business bailouts and buying bad debt, create positive balance of payments, federal tax on security transaction concept advanced by Dean Miller, the Was Dean Baker rather, the Washington economist, hold military spending to a fixed percent of the federal budget, pay all, and cut back on unnecessary departments. The one that I'd like to propose is if we pay all elected officials in the years when the budget is balanced, and we don't pay them <laughs> when the budget is not balanced, uh, we can get a balanced budget. I'm advocating this if you want to run for office. If you run for political office on this platform, you will be elected. Uh, the problem is if we do not pay the federal debt, we're in trouble. I quote Admiral Michael Mullen, former chief of staff, who told us in 2010 and 2011, the national debt is the biggest threat we have to national security. By not paying it, we run through the scenario of empire dissolution. Let's take this option off the table. There are those who fear our federal debt will be unjust burden on our children and grandchildren. I dream our collective common sense will cause this burden to wither away. Together, let's find a way to make this dream come true. <laughs>